My old man was an unemployed Italian immigrant steelworker. If anybody here is old enough to remember the crash of the steel industry in the 70s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and all across the Rust Belt, um, our family was a victim of that. Now, as a kid, I would hear my father come home and bemoan at the, at the dinner table about the practices that were going on in his workplace. Literally, 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 his boss, the manager, would tell him to slow down because he was making the boss look bad because he was throwing off the measured piecemeal rate by his work pace. Now, if you, looked, if, you, if you went back and opened the newspaper for the 70s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, what you would have seen is you would have seen headlines that said cheap foreign imports from Japan. And the accusation was that Japanese labor was flooding the American marketplace, allowing uh, inappropriate competition. Now, if you juxtapose that against what my father was saying, and in historical context, I've had the ability to research this, something else was actually going on. There were a set of researchers in the United States that had started to think about new ways of manufacturing and working. They were people whose names you may or may not know, certainly you know Drucker, but you may not know Deming, Duran, and others. And they were studying something called total quality management. TQM, what some of us know as Six Sigma today, continuous process improvement. It was being studied in the United States, but it was ignored by the American steel industry. All of a sudden, though, the Japanese got a hold of these principles of constant refinement and perfection of a work process, and they adopted them. And yes, as a result of that, they were able to deliver cheap and higher quality foreign imports, which crashed the steel industry. Now keep that in the back of your head for a moment because it's gonna be relevant to my career trajectory. But as a kid, I'm sitting there hearing my dad bemoan everything that we are suffering, unemployed. My dad was busting his ass, trying to make ends meet, taking any job possible, ditch digging, you know, you name it, everything, everything, everything. Um, my, my mom, had to go get a job as a cleaning lady, which she hated. Um, and I'll, I'll mention in a moment what job I had to go get to contribute to the family as well. But what was most important then was there was something born in this young man, myself, through a contract with my dad and I. Someday, I would grow up and I would, now you're gonna laugh, I would be governor of Pennsylvania and then president of the United States and I would fix American manufacturing. At the, at the age of 10, that was my mission. I would grow up and fix American manufacturing through political route. I didn't know any better in terms of what would be the appropriate route to, to change the economic state of families. That's what underlied my core belief. Now, my old man, uh, found out that there was a local country club. I grew up in Pittsburgh, by the local country club, but where we lived is called Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And I went and got a job as a caddy. What are one of the most extraordinary jobs you could possibly have? You're outdoors for 20 bucks a day. I carried golf clubs, met interesting people, and I made the same amount of money my mom was making on her knees scrubbing floors. Now, the difference is that, you know, I would go up there and literally I would sit for five days, sometimes get out once, right? So it wasn't quite the same ROI in terms of my time, but it was meaningful to my family if I could bring back that 20 bucks. So my old man, my old man said something to me. He said, uh, he said, Keith, this is my first day. He's like, show up, the, up at the golf course a half an hour early. And I'm like, Pop, I don't think there's anybody there. <laughs> and then he repeated himself. Show up at the golf course half an hour. When my dad repeated himself, I knew I didn't have a shot. <laughs> I called it immigrant Tourette's. He would just blurt shit out. I wouldn't understand it, but I would be like, okay, fine. I'll show up at the golf course half an hour early. You're driving, so why not? So I'm up there and I'm walking around the golf course and I noticed things. I literally was by myself. And I noticed things, if you're not a golfer, I'll try to translate this. I noticed where the pins were placed because they change them every day. And if it was a blind shot, I could tell my golfer, no, you don't need an eight iron, you need a nine because the pin's at the front of the green. 
Or I would notice whether or not the greens were cut that morning so I knew that they'd be faster. So I noticed things. Plus, I had this drive and ambition, and I needed the job, and so I had hustle. Now, this is important because one day, my, my fate changed. I had a lady. Her name was Mrs. Poland. Mrs. Poland was the best golfer in the country club, except for Arnie Palmer, who owned the country club. And she played every single day, and she had me as her caddy. It was just a random pull. And I caddied for her. And at the end of the time, she said, Keith, would you caddy for me tomorrow? Like, wow, big deal. So I go up there, caddied for the next day. Same thing at the end of the caddy session. How about the next day? Absolutely. So by the third time I'm caddying for her, she started asking me questions of a personal nature that made me very uncomfortable. Now, this is not a Mrs. Robinson story. We're not <laughs> going there. Questions like, what do you want to do with your life? Now, that was not a question I was prepared to answer, because I was terrified. My old man had gotten me into a small private elementary school on a full scholarship. I tell this story and never it alone. Um, and I got bullied, made fun of because of the clothes that I had, the car that we drove, beat up green Nova with rust spots. My dad's hands, he could never get them clean. Uh, there'd always be like dirt in the, in the, even though he'd scrub them with gasoline, right? And kids would make fun of that. Um, carpools. Someone bring me home, they'd say, oh, we're, one of the girls in the room, was, oh, we're going down into the hole, which was because we lived out in the country and we had to back a dirt alley. Um, Mrs. Poland represented something scary to me. Uh, wealth was scary to me because the kids of wealth were scary to me. And all I wanted to do was keep my head down and do the job and get my 20 bucks and bring it home to my family, right? Um, this becomes really important. I've had um, I have two foster children, and both of my boys are of color, and I often understand from their perspective, sometimes they just want to keep their head down and not lift their heads up and engage with people that to them are other that they're afraid won't engage with them in the way that they would want to be engaged with. And, and I can reflect back on a day when I felt the same way. Um, but Mrs. Poland dragged it out of me. She literally said, damn it, Keith, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, you're going to laugh. It's funny. I just said that a second ago, too. I still think that in the back of my head. Um, I said, you're going to laugh, but my dad says if I work hard, study hard, get good grades, I can do anything. That's why we came to the United States. You know, an American-born kid can do anything. I could be president of the United States someday. And she didn't laugh, and she looked at me, and she says, yes, you could. She said, I would vote for you. 